webinar Q&A about psoriatic arthritis. My name is Bev Bromfield, Patient Education Programs Manager here at the National Psoriasis Foundation. I'd like to introduce you to our guest moderator for today's webinar, Dr. Brett Ringdahl. Dr. Ringdahl is a behavioral sleep medicine clinical psychologist in Arizona where he specializes in evidence-based psychological interventions for those who struggle with anxiety, depression, chronic pain, and mental health concerns related to physical illness, weight management, trauma, and sleep issues. He's also a one-to-one -one mentor and volunteer with the National Psoriasis Foundation, who has had years of experience managing his plaque psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, where he recognizes the importance of support and community. Thank you, Dr. Ringdahl, for being here today. Thank you, Bev. Thank you for such a warm introduction. I'm so happy to be here. This is great. I love NPF. It's fantastic. Uh, we'll just go over some ground rules. I want to get to the questions as soon as possible because we got a lot. So before we start, we will just go over some things about how to participate in today's event, right? We've taken a screenshot of the attendee interface. You should see a panel that looks like this on your computer. Desktop on the right side. You join this computer computer presentation using your audio system by default. That means that if you hear music through your computer, you should be able to hear the presentation. If you prefer to join over the telephone, select use telephone in the audio pane, the dial-in information will be provided to you. Follow the instructions as provided, right? We've received a ton of questions today uh, in advance of the webinar that you will still have an opportunity to ask questions uh, for our presenter, rheumatologist, Dr. Arthur Mandolin, uh, by typing the questions into the pane on the control panel. So we'll try to address as many questions as possible during our time with Dr. Mandolin. I wanna take a moment just to acknowledge and thank our sponsor, AbbVie. AbbVie's great for their support in Psoriatic Arthritis Action Month activities, which include today's webinar. So thank you, Abby. Love you. And then before we start, just a few words about the National Psoriasis Foundation uh, and what we do, right? At the heart of what we do, our mission is to drive efforts to cure psoriatic diseases and improve the lives of those affected, right? We accomplish our mission by a funding research, which, with, which is over $30 million awarded in grants and fellowships, collaborative and transformational research initiatives. The MPF also offers education for those living with psoriatic disease and encourages all to become involved with our mission. Learn more about research, education, and how you can become involved by viewing the links in this slide, please. So on behalf of the National Psoriasis Foundation, thank you for attending today's webinar, Q&A about psoriatic arthritis. I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Arthur Mandlin. Dr. Mandolin is a rheumatologist and associate professor of medicine at Northwestern University, Feinberg School of Medicine in the Department of Medicine, Division of Rheumatology in Chicago, Illinois. Dr. Mandolin's clinical interests include psoriatic arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, gout, ankylosing spondylitis, Sogren syndrome, joint injections, Interventional ultrasound. In fact, he is a recent uh, co-author on an article released in the Journal of Rheumatology this past uh, February 2023 about the clinical assessment and management of enthesitis uh, with PSA. So his clinical research interests are in the field of musculoskeletal ultrasonography. He's got extensive knowledge about musculos musculoskeletal screening for arthritic diseases, specifically ultrasound guided minimally invasive synovial biopsies. So Dr. Mandolin is a past member of National Psoriasis Foundation's Medical Board and a professional member of the foundation. As a member of the medical board, he served on the consensus panel for the development of a variety of our practice guidelines. So it's my honor to welcome Dr. Arthur Mandolin, who will address your questions through our Q&A about psoriatic arthritis webinar today. So let's please welcome Dr. Arthur Mandolin. Thank you so much, Brett. It's great to be here today. Uh, I always have to start with these things with a little bit of housekeeping of my own. Here are some financial disclosures. Um, I'm currently ser or recently served as a formulary consultant for CVS. I've been on various speakers bureaus for some of these pharmaceutical companies, some of whom make medications that are used for psoriatic arthritis, some of whom don't. Um, and I've been uh, a speaker, obviously, as I am tonight, uh, and also a slide deck content creator for the National Psoriasis Foundation. In fact, a couple of the slides uh, I think we're going to see this evening are actually mine. <laughs> We're going to look at a couple of different Q&A categories tonight, four of them in particular. 
We're going to talk about the types of arthritis and how they may differ from psoriatic arthritis. We're going to talk about what symptoms might lead you to suspect you might have psoriatic arthritis, how that diagnosis is arrived at by your rheumatologist or your dermatologist, preferentially both, um, and some of the treatments for psoriatic arthritis um, and some of the, the ways in which psoriatic arthritis or other psoriatic diseases might affect your life in general or your other medical issues called comorbidities. So what are the various types of arthritis and how does that differ from psoriatic arthritis or how do we differentiate psoriatic arthritis from other types of arthritis? Turns out there's over a hundred types of arthritis, although the big ones are the common ones and there's uh, maybe a dozen or so that we see most of the time in clinical practice of which psoriatic arthritis is one of them. So we're gonna start with our first panel of questions here. Uh, is it easy to differentiate psoriatic arthritis from osteoarthritis? Generally speaking, yes. Psoriatic arthritis is an inflammatory form of arthritis, just as psoriatic skin disease is an inflammatory skin disease. And this, we think, is the link between the two, the inflammatory process. Osteoarthritis, although it can have inflammatory features and it can have some inflammatory characteristics to it in some patients more than others, osteoarthritis is thought of generally as being more wear and tear. That's oversimplifying, but generally osteoarthritis is wear and tear. And most importantly, when you do an x-ray of an affected area of the body, generally speaking, osteoarthritis is fairly easy to differentiate. You can tell what wear and tear looks like. The radiologist is not confused by that and can tell you this looks like wear and tear disease. On the other hand, psoriatic arthritis, um, first of all, often doesn't affect the bone at all. It can in some cases. And when it does affect the bone, the way in which psoriatic arthritis affects the bone is different from the way in which osteoarthritis affects the bone. So a, a psoriatic patient who is having bone damage from their psoriatic arthritis will look different on x-ray. And in fact, x-ray is one of the best ways to tell psoriatic arthritis from other forms of arthritis. Fortunately for the patient, but unfortunately for the doctor, psoriatic damage in the bone is uncommon. And this is one of the reasons why we wanna catch this disease earlier. And we wanna come up with better ways to look at the soft tissue that surrounds the bone, which is really where the disease starts. Um, this leads into the second question. Can you have psoriasis and only have osteoarthritis? And this person um, mentions some areas that, that are bothering them. Um, I guess I should, Make a quick pause here and mention that, of course, because I can't see you through the screen, I can't examine you, I don't know your entire medical history back to the day you were born, I can't in any of these questions speak specifically to a particular patient. But we can certainly use these questions as a jumping off point to speak more broadly about patients like this. So uh, a patient like this, someone who has skin psoriasis only. Um, certainly can uh, have osteoarthritis without other forms of arthritis. Statistically speaking, um, about one third of patients who have skin psoriasis will at some point in their life develop psoriatic arthritis, which means two thirds don't. Um, and of course, we all get older. And uh, one of the sort of jokes, a little bit of morbid doctor humor, but one of the sort of jokes that I tell my patients when they ask, you know, when am I going to need a knee replacement? Well, I tell them, if you live to be 200, you're going to need one. But certain patients need to have their bones and joints looked at or, or uh, addressed by an orthopedic surgeon sooner and some later. In the same way, if, if we lived long enough, we would pretty much all have osteoarthritis. So anybody, particularly somebody who's at the age of 60, could very easily have osteoarthritis. Not every 60-year-old does, but it, you could very easily have osteoarthritis at 60 and have skin psoriasis in, in addition. Um, I think we've already answered the next one, how is psoriatic arthritis different from other forms and how can we tell the difference? The major indicator to be able to rule out psoriatic arthritis, that's a tough one. Um, it, I kind of have to go back to the first question again here and say that the best way to tell psoriatic arthritis and to quote unquote prove it or to know it definitively would be on x-ray. So uh, we really don't have a blood test or any type of test that will 100% definitively say 
oh yes, this has to be psoriatic arthritis. And on the flip side of the coin, we don't have a blood test or other type of test that will definitively say, this could not possibly be psoriatic arthritis. We have, the way I describe it to patients is votes on the jury. And we come to a conclusion based on which way the votes fall or which way things look. And sometimes because we don't have a, a good blood test, for example, for psoriatic arthritis, it really comes down to having your, uh, your dermatologist or your rheumatologist who has had years and years of experience. And we follow the old rule of if it looks like a duck and if it quacks like a duck, then it's a duck. And, and sometimes it really just is clinical acumen, just the, the experience of the doctor that says, you know, I've seen a whole bunch of psoriatic arthritis and you look like one and you don't look like other kinds of arthritis that I've seen in my career. And oftentimes that's the best way to do it. Um, we wish that we had a good blood test, one that would, you know, a, a psoriatic factor in the way that we have a rheumatoid factor blood test, but it just doesn't exist. Um, and if we have some time at the end, um, certainly somebody in the audience or Brett, you could throw the question at me, you know, what are some of the things that are on the horizon in terms of maybe being able to get some better diagnostic testing? Um, I don't think we want to spend time on that right now since we have limited time in the webinar, and that would be sort of looking to the future rather than addressing the here and the now, which is what we want to do today, address the here and the now. Which types of arthritis are reversible? Very, very few. I mean, certainly wear and tear arthritis, the clock doesn't go back. Um, I tell patients, you can't take candles off the birthday cake. It's only gonna get <laughs> to be a bigger and bigger blaze as the years go on. Um, so we cannot really reverse most forms of arthritis. Now we can put some inflammatory forms of arthritis, including psoriatic arthritis, into remission. Is that really the same as reversibility? Depends what you mean by reversible. If you're that unlucky patient who has bone damage from their arthritis, psoriatic or whatever type of arthritis, that we consider to be not reversible, which is why we have to get to patients early. Um, and we're gonna talk about some of the ways in which a dermatologist can help us out with that um, as we move into the other parts of the other slides in the presentation tonight. Um, so that really is the answer to that question, is that most arthritis is not reversible. It can be controlled. It can be put into what we call medicated remission, which is the goal, um, but not really reversible. And particularly bone damage is not considered reversible. So we do want to catch people early if we can. Uh, do many patients who present as having psoriatic arthritis also have seropositive rheumatoid arthritis? And that kind of um, goes into the next question uh, as well. Is it common for people to have both? psoriatic and rheumatoid. There, I'm not sure that every expert in the world would agree, but generally speaking, um, the vast majority, as far as I'm aware, of rheumatologists and dermatologists consider psoriatic arthritis and rheumatoid arthritis to be different diseases. Now, you can get a mixed picture, uh, a mixed arthritis, which can seem to borrow some psoriatic features over here and some rheumatoid features over there, but we would consider such a patient, if you're splitting hairs, we would consider such a patient to have a mixed arthritis. We wouldn't really say that they truly have both rheumatoid and psoriatic. And I do have a number of patients who have some features that look kind of mixed, kind of a picture that is both, but I don't consider them to have two arthritises. I consider them to have one arthritis that has features of two different, um, more pure types of arthritis, um, and they have a more mixed picture. And how do you treat patients who seem to have features of both conditions? Basically, a look at what's active today. You know, what's bothering the patient now? What, if they do have abnormal testing of blood or x-ray or whatever, what seems to be the most impressive, most scary testing that they have going on? Um, and you attack the things that look like they're the most trouble. And whether those are rheumatoid type features or psoriatic type features, whatever, you move in that direction of what bothers the patient on their side of the of the exam room and what bothers you looking in the chart as the doctor on your side of the exam room. That's how we kind of do that. How does one discern the difference between the pain of psoriatic arthritis and fibromyalgia? That also can be difficult because fibromyalgia is another disease that doesn't have a solid blood test and is more often than not, or 
almost always diagnosed based on clinical experience by the, the impression of the doctor who's treating the patient. And because of that, there aren't a lot of clues. One of the things that we can use for that is that generally speaking, psoriatic arthritis will tend to attack joints or tendons or ligaments. Um, and there are certain features of that type of inflammatory attack that the doctor can see. Fibromyalgia tends to be pain, generally speaking, there are exceptions, but generally speaking more in the muscles. So patients who come in and say that they hurt not in the joint, but in the muscle. For example, someone who comes in and says, I don't really hurt in my shoulder and I don't really hurt in my elbow. I hurt in the arm between the two that might be a warning sign toward fibromyalgia rather than psoriatic or some other form of arthritis. Nothing is perfect. Every patient is different, but that might be a little yellow flag to tell you, hmm, maybe this is fibromyalgia instead if it's not really centered in the bones and the joints and the tendons and ligaments that surround those structures. So I think that takes us through the first um, panel of questions. Here's a couple of slides to sort of help us to, to review what we just went through. Um, a healthy joint is seen here uh, in the top left. I don't know if you guys can see my pointer, um, but there's a bone being seen. And then this other little piece off to the side um, is kneecap. So we're looking at a knee here. And in a healthy joint, we have cartilage, which is this white stripe on the end of the bone. Um, and that area of cartilage between the two uh, cartilage surfaces has some lubricating joint fluid, and the whole thing is connected um, basically in an envelope or a bag that keeps the fluid there so it doesn't just run down your shin into your ankle, keeps it there to, to um, lubricate that joint. In the far lower left, we see osteoarthritis, where the bone is kind of worn down, particularly the cartilage is kind of worn down, and that's kind of more the issue with quote unquote, wear and tear forms of arthritis, this wearing down of the cartilage. So osteoarthritis, generally speaking, is considered to be a cartilage disease more than anything else. Rheumatoid arthritis is considered to be a disease of the joint lining more than the cartilage, more than the bone. Although as the lining gets inflamed and stays inflamed, it can irritate bone and cartilage and cause damage there. So here in the rheumatoid picture, we see that that uh, that capsule shown in red that surrounds the joint is really the initial place where the attack happens. And then on the right hand side of the slide, we see psoriatic arthritis, where there's kind of combinations of, of many of these things. Psoriatic um, arthritis, we believe, does start more in the soft tissues that surround the joint, but there can be involvement of bone, there can be involvement of cartilage particularly as the disease is progressive or is long standing and has been around for a long time. Um, one of the things that tends to differentiate psoriatic arthritis from the other forms of arthritis is its tendency to attack ligament and tendon specifically. Not in every patient, but in many psoriatic patients, uh, ligament and tendon are the areas that are being attacked. That can happen in other inflammatory forms like rheumatoid, but psoriatic is more famous for it. So who's at risk for psoriatic arthritis? Um, the greatest risk factor is having skin psoriasis. 90% um, of psoriatic disease patients will have skin disease first and then develop psoriatic arthritis later. And uh, only one third of skin patients will get psoriatic arthritis as we discussed earlier. And there can be a delay of up to 10 years between your skin disease and your bone and joint disease, which is why we want dermatologists to be watching their skin patients to make sure that they stay skin only and don't evolve into skin and joint. Or if they do evolve into skin and joint, then fine, get them to the rheumatologist early so that we can attack both arms of the disease, the skin and the joints. About 40% of people who get psoriatic arthritis have a family history of a close relative um, particularly, we are worried if people have a first degree relative, so um, a child, a parent, a brother or sister who has psoriatic disease. Being uh, obese or overweight is a risk factor for developing psoriatic arthritis. And being uh, younger when your skin disease strikes you is a potential risk factor for developing psoriatic arthritis. 
Other things that have been suggested include smoking, alcohol, and various environmental triggers. So that moves us forward then into uh, what are the symptoms and how do we diagnose psoriatic arthritis? And so the, obviously the first question is, what, what are we looking for? And basically, because nine times out of 10, a psoriatic arthritis patient is gonna have skin disease first, we're looking mostly for that skin psoriasis patient who then develops bone and joint pain or pain and swelling in the other structures like the tendons, like the ligaments that surround and connect the bones and the joints. And particularly if that is a, a new onset of pain with swelling, swelling is not required, but is common. Um, those are the patients that we wanna have referred to rheumatology by the dermatology colleagues so that we can uh, evaluate them and determine if indeed this is psoriatic arthritis, and if so, what do we do about that? So that kind of answers both of the first two questions. And we've said several times tonight already the answer to the third question, it is not automatic. Two thirds of patients with skin psoriasis will never get psoriatic arthritis, only one third do. Should I ask my rheumatologist to do more than just x-ray my feet after a diagnosis of psoriatic arthritis? Again, the most honest answer I can give you there is it depends. Where are you hurting? And it would, generally speaking, the areas of the body that we are concerned about are the areas that hurt. Pain is there for a reason. So if you have psoriatic arthritis pain in your feet and not in your hands, then you probably don't need a hand x-ray. But if you have pain in your hands and your feet, maybe you should be x-raying the hands and the feet. And it, it becomes a, 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 a discussion and a decision between you and the rheumatologist. What areas are we most concerned about now? What areas do we most urgently need to evaluate now. And over time, we may end up x-raying various areas of the body where there may or may not be symptoms. Um, and it sort of depends on each individual patient case as we move forward through a patient's disease course. It might not be necessary to x-ray every single area of the body that hurts. We may be able, after x-raying the areas that are the big trouble spots, to learn the things we need to learn to help us make treatment decisions particularly because, I mean, x-rays are safe overall, but x-rays do involve radiation. So once we've made a decision, we then have to sort of ask ourselves, okay, if I went ahead now and x-rayed the next thing and the next thing and the next thing, would the answer I get back from the x-ray potentially change what I do in medication? Would it change the treatment? And if the answer is no, no matter what the x-ray says, I'm going this way or no matter what the x-ray says, I'm going that way because of all the previous information I have from previous blood testing, from previous x-rays, from having examined and spoken to the patient. If another x-ray isn't gonna change my mind, why shoot radiation at the patient? So that's kind of how we decide uh, on that. Is enthesitis of the rib cage a common area affected in the PSA and is it harder to treat patients who have enthesitis? So of course we have to stop real quick and, and define enthesitis. We talked about psoriatic arthritis being more likely than other forms of inflammatory arthritis to attack tendons and ligaments. Other forms of inflammatory arthritis can do that, but psoriatic arthritis is, is the famous one that does it more commonly. And any place where a tendon arrives at the bone it's gonna to attach to and attaches into that bone so that it can pull on the bone, which is the job of a tendon. That area where the tendon is blending into and becoming bone is called the enthesis. So it isn't like your tendon here and your bone there. There is a, a blending area where you're kind of a tendony bony thingy and then you become bone. So that area of transition, is the enthesis. And when that area is inflamed, that's called enthesitis. Itis just means inflammation. So um, is enthesitis of the rib cage a common area affected in psoriatic arthritis? In my experience, no, but certainly it can happen. Uh, is it harder to treat patients who have enthesitis? Not necessarily. There are certain medications who are uh, better at treating enthesitis than others. And with any type of psoriatic arthritis, no matter whether you're bone predominant or enthesis predominant or skin predominant or nail predominant, um, fingernail, toenail predominant, um, there's always gonna be patients out there who are gonna be easy to treat. And we wish we knew why <laughs> so that we could bottle that up <laughs> and give it to other people. But 
we just don't. And there are always going to be patients who are going to be hard to treat. So I've seen enthesitis that responded beautifully to medication. And I've seen enthesitis that doesn't seem to respond to anything I try. So overall, I can't really say that enthesitis in general is harder to treat than other types of psoriatic arthritis or other um, flavors of psoriatic arthritis. How is psoriatic arthritis different in people with dark complexions compared to those of lighter complexions? I'm not aware that the bone and joint or the tendon and ligament aspects of psoriatic arthritis are different in people who have, um, as we call it, ethnic skin or darker complexions. Um, I'm not aware that, aware that there are differences in that way. The only way that I can think of that might be different in people with dark complexions would be, it can be more difficult to recognize the skin psoriasis in a patient who has um, darker skin, ethnic skin. Um, and because that could lead to a delay in diagnosis of their psoriasis, it could then lead to a subsequent delay in the diagnosis of their psoriatic arthritis. And of course, if you let the fire burn, it's going to be harder to put it out. Um, so that doesn't really say that the disease itself is different in a dark skinned person, but because they may have a delay in diagnosis because it's harder to define or to recognize their skin psoriasis, that can be an issue for those patients. So as I was talking about earlier, we want to get these patients to rheumatology as early as possible. And we want to remember that patients with skin disease can take up to 10 years to develop arthritic disease. So we want the dermatology colleagues to be constantly looking at their skin psoriasis patients to make sure that psoriatic arthritis is not developing. And there are a whole number of different questionnaires that have been developed for that. Um, I don't personally favor one over another because I'm not a dermatologist and I don't use them in my practice. I kind of get the patients when they've scored positive on the skin questionnaire. Um, for some reason, they all tend to have four letter acronym names. I don't know why. Um, it just kind of turned out that way. Um, but I guess these are good four letter words because we, we want this to happen. We want patients to be given the pest or some other similar type of psoriatic arthritis questionnaire. And this basically is the, is the content of the pest. Have you ever had a swollen joint or more than one swollen joint? Most inflammatory arthritis does swell. So arthritis that swells versus arthritis that doesn't swell gives you a hint toward that could be inflammatory. Has a doctor ever told you you have arthritis? Obviously, that could be a big clue. Um, do your fingernails or toenails have holes or pits? We don't mean holes through and through. It looks like if you grabbed a pen, that is not a pen. <laughs> if you grabbed a pen and just went bam, 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 and made a whole bunch of dots in a dent, dents in your fingernail, with the tip of a pen. That's kind of what it looks like. If you imagined your fingernail as being softer than it really is and making pen marks in it with the tip of a ballpoint pen, that's what it looks like. Um, and that's what we're looking for because that suggests that the enthesis, again, where a tendon joins into a bone. So in that case, if I can get close enough for the camera, <laughs> right at the end of your finger, obviously you have a knuckle. And there's a tendon there that makes your knuckle straighten out or makes your knuckle bend. And as that tendon merges into the bone right at the end of your fingertip, it turns out that the spot, the enthesis, where that tendon lands on the bone to do its job pulling on the bone to make the bone move, that's right next to the beginning of your fingernail, right next to your cuticle, deep under si on, the, on the inside, but right next to it. So when that area is inflamed, it disrupts fingernail growth, and that's why it looks like that with those little pits in there. So because we see those pits, we then just run the whole logic backward. If pits are there, nail growth was disrupted. If nail growth was disrupted, it probably happened from enthesitis. If the patient has enthesitis, now I'm worried about psoriatic arthritis. So that's why that question is there. Pain in the heel, same thing. Achilles tendon landing on the heel. Now, importantly, we're not necessarily talking about pain on the sole of your heel. We're talking about pain in the back of your heel, in a place where you might see a woman wear a Band-Aid if she's wearing fancy shoes that don't really aren't really comfortable to wear, um, the so-called pump bump. Um, that's the area of the heel we're worried about, right where the Achilles tendon lands and joins into the back of the heel bone. Um, so that could also be enthesitis. And then have you ever had a finger or a toe that was completely swollen? Not just the knuckle, but the whole digit 
the whole finger or the whole toe all swollen up. Um, sometimes it even lo looks like a, like a cigar, really fat in the middle and skinny on both ends. Um, that's called dactylitis, swelling of an entire digit. And that's a big clue for psoriatic arthritis as well, because um, that's really uncommon in any other inflammatory form of arthritis. So how do we diagnose psoriatic arthritis? Again, there is no blood test. So we have what we call the CASPAR criteria. And I'm sorry, I don't remember what CASPAR stands for. <laughs> Maybe somebody can shout it at me later. Um, but it, it's, it's a set of criteria for diagnosing psoriatic arthritis. And basically on this list that you see here on the screen, if you have three points, then you're, it's not guaranteed that you have psoriatic arthritis, but we're strongly concerned. You would be eligible for the diagnosis of psoriatic arthritis. So you need to have pain, arthritis, enthesitis, spondylitis, pain in your spine. These things we've just been talking about in the past slide. And then you have to have two or three of the following things. So why do we say two or three? The reason we say two or three is for most people, you need to have three things on this list. But if you're sitting in the office in front of me with visible psoriasis on your skin right now today, the very first item there, not past history, but current skin psoriasis, that counts double. So if you have psoriasis right now in the office, as I meet you for the first time, you already have two points and you only need one other thing off of this list. Um, and we won't go through the entire thing because uh, their audience tonight isn't doctors, but just in case for those who were curious and were asking the question, um, in the absence of a blood test, since there isn't a blood test for psoriatic arthritis, this is one of the most respected ways that we um, do this diagnosis. So getting into treatments, it looks like we're doing pretty good on time. What advice do we have for someone who's been recently diagnosed? Um, I think the most important thing is, and I don't believe we have a slide on this in, in this slide deck, but we, we consider that there are sort of six target areas of the body where psoriatic arthritis might be most dominant. So skin is one area. People who don't have very much arthritis at all and their predominant problem is skin disease. That's one, we call them domain, one domain of psoriatic arthritis. People whose spine is predominantly involved, that's a domain for psoriatic arthritis. People who have fingernail disease, that's a domain. We talked about enthesitis, we talked about dactylitis, an entire digit being swollen, those are domains. And then your classic just joints hurting is a domain of psoriatic arthritis. So when you go in to see um, your position for the first time with your new diagnosis of psoriatic arthritis, I think one of the key things to do is to determine with your physician of the various domains of psoriatic arthritis, which one is driving you today. And this could change over time, but which one is driving you today? Because that helps us somewhat in choosing medications. If inflammation is in, under control with biologics, we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit because we haven't really talked about biologics yet, but we're getting there. Um, um, we could even generalize this. If inflammation is under control with any treatment, how could you still be experiencing pain? Well, that again gets a little bit complicated. One of the first things to think about is what do we mean by under control? Under control measured how? Under control based on blood testing? Blood testing isn't perfect. Under control based on x-rays, MRIs, ultrasound? Even those things aren't necessarily perfect. They're reliable, but they're not perfect. So it's possible for a person to have inflammation that's just hard to detect, right? You've gone from having red lights and siren on fire inflammation that was obvious in the testing to inflammation that isn't all that impressive and might fly under the radar. And maybe our modern testing isn't sensitive enough to see it anymore. That's good news overall. But if you have any inflammation left at all, you could still have pain. Um, we also have to recognize that uh, going back to our first set of questions, the person who was asking about, you know, could I be 60 years old and have wear and tear? Sure you could. And I can give you all the medicine in the world to get your psoriatic arthritis to complete remission, totally asleep, um, no psoriatic arthritis disease activity. And if your knees are worn out, they're worn out. If you've got no cartilage left and you're grinding bone on bone, then you have a different form of arthritis that's that's uh, causing you trouble. So there could be other sources of pain um, besides psoriatic arthritis. 
is the only way the next couple are kind of uh, together, is the only way to stop the progression of disease to go on medication, anything with diet and supplements. Um, can you improve psoriatic arthritis with diet? So there is a position paper from the National Psoriasis Foundation about dietary supplements in psoriatic arthritis. Um, and I'm sure your local representative from the NPF can get you a copy of that paper. Um, but overall, the, the, the long and the short of that is, for that patient who comes in and asks me, can I control this only with diet or only with nutritional supplements? The answer to that question is almost always no. I, I can't remember the last patient who was able to control their psoriatic disease with only diet or with only supplement. Now, could you potentially find a diet or a supplement that might give you some assistance, might make you be able to take less medicine rather than more medicine? Those patients are out there. Um, I haven't counted every single one of them, but if I just sort of threw a guess out there, I would say 40% of my patients who try a diet or try a supplement will eventually figure out one that does make a difference for them. Um, it's not going to be the entire answer. They're not going to stop their traditional from the pharmacy medication, but it may make a meaningful difference for them. Your next question is going to be, okay, so what's my favorite supplement? And the answer is, everybody is different. And anything that you've heard about or read about, I've had a patient who has told me, oh, this was the best thing I ever tried. And the next patient comes through the door and says, that was useless. I had to do this other thing. So one patient comes in and tells me, I had to go gluten-free. The next patient comes in and says, gluten doesn't make a difference to me at all. I had to go dairy-free. Next patient comes in and says, dairy doesn't make a difference to me at all. I had to get rid of high fructose corn syrup. Next patient comes in and says, high fructose corn syrup was useless when I got rid of it. I felt just the same. I got rid of nightshade vegetables. Next patient comes in and says, I took high dose vitamin D. And it, it, all these patients are telling the truth. Each of them has found their own truth. And unfortunately, unless you have like a, a glaring vitamin D deficiency on blood testing, which I will sometimes look for, um, I can't specifically tell you what your dietary intervention is, if you even have one. Remember, 40% of patients in my personal experience, my estimate, um, may have some benefit from diets and supplements. That means 60% don't. No harm in trying, um, but just recognize that odds are worse than 50-50 that you probably won't find a diet or a supplement that really makes a difference. Um, but certainly no harm in trying. So yeah, the, the, and then the, the other question you hear about progression of disease, here we have to define our terms. What do we mean by progression of disease? If you're asking about progression of bone damage, you know, saying, hey, doctor, the last x-rays I had show that I have, unfortunately, the start of some early bone damage from my psoriatic arthritis. Can I control that with diet? There, I think the answers are quite clear. Um, bone damage cannot be controlled with diet alone. Bone damage cannot be controlled with supplements alone. There you need medication and you need big medication. I mean, I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but let's be forthright and truthful. If you have bone damage from inflammatory arthritis, not just soft tissue swelling and discomfort, but bone damage, you need a big drug. And, and we can get into some of those things. Um, what are the top three drugs to help combat daily fatigue? We believe we have to back up and see, well, where does the fatigue come from? And the most honest answer I can give you is we don't really know, but the current theory is that the fatigue comes from the inflammatory burden of the arthritis. And in the same way that when you have the flu or any other type of infectious process, you're inflamed and you just feel run down and tired and crappy, and you just have this flu-like syndrome. Patients who have arthritis but aren't infected can have this same run down, crappy feeling, just that their uh, their body is fighting, you know, some sort of of, a, of an inflammatory process. And in this case, it would be psoriatic arthritis. Um, that's how we where we think that the daily fatigue is coming from. Um, so that knowing that as the proposed origin of the fatigue, that sort of gives you the clue then as to what the answer to the question is. As the best thing to do, um, the most success that I have had in my patients in relieving fatigue is to attack the arthritis, get the inflammation to go away. It doesn't always work, 
but that's the best, most reliable way is to get the inflammation under control. There is no drug that is specifically anti-fatigue that has worked well for me. It really is just attack the arthritis as a whole. And as the arthritis gets better, everything about the arthritis gets better. That's been my personal experience. Is it better to jump between treatments or wait for months before trying something new? Probably one of the most frustrating thing about psoriatic arthritis treatment is that most of our medicines do not work quickly. You know, I think we, um, those of us who have experienced this um, all understand that steroids work very rapidly and have a lot of side effects. Um, the medications that you see advertised on TV, basically all of them take time to work. Um, there are a lot of excellent drugs out there. Um, they, the people who make those drugs have have the money to make TV commercials <laughs> for a reason, because their drugs work and they work well, but they don't work quickly. It's just the way the process happens, the way the chemistry occurs. You can't make those drugs work quickly. It's just not the way the machine rolls. So we do tell people that they should, if they can tolerate it, they should wait for perhaps as long as three months on a given treatment before they switch to a new treatment um, because it can take that long for the treatment to kick in. Um, now, certainly you can be on your pain relievers. You can be on your steroids, hopefully not a lot of steroids, while you're waiting for the medicine to hopefully kick in and do its job. But you really do have to wait um, because the last thing you want to do is start on a medicine, take two or three doses and say, well, it's not working. I give up and move on. If only you had continued and maybe the medicine would have worked. And we got to recognize also that while we have a lot of medicine out there for psoriatic arthritis, there's a slide coming up with the names on there. We don't have an infinite number of medicines. And psoriatic arthritis for the vast, vast, vast majority of people is a lifelong condition that you need to control, like blood pressure, like diabetes, like low thyroid. You don't ever cure it. You control it. And people can do very well. And people can be um, uh, very happy with their medication controlling their, their arthritis, but you have to stay on the medication. And because we have a limited number of medicines, a lot of them, but a limited number, and you're going to be on these medicines for the rest of your life for most people, you don't want to run through them too quickly and get to the end of the road where you say to yourself, well, I've tried everything that's out there. Now what? So um, it is not better to jump between treatments. It really is better to take your time and wait for the months and months um, and use uh, quick acting medication like pain relievers and steroids while you're waiting for the, the, the uh, cornerstone drugs, the underlying medicine that you're hoping is gonna be the, the foundation of your treatment uh, to kick in and do its job. A person mentions that their son has psoriasis and wondering should he take biologics to prevent damage in the future? Uh, psoriasis on the hands, nails, and feet. So I'm presuming reading this question that we're talking in general about someone who has only skin uh, and nail disease and does not currently have psoriatic arthritis. Uh, so for that purpose, you would not take a biologic to prevent the onset of psoriatic arthritis. We don't have any evidence that that would work or that that would help. And we have to recognize that all of these medications, any medicine in the world, have the um, potential for side effects. Even aspirin, even Tylenol has a potential for side effects in some unfortunate patients or if overused, if too much is taken. Um, so we don't put medication on to prevent the onset of psoriatic arthritis. Now, if we flip to the other side of that question, let's say that we talk about a psoriatic arthritis patient in whom we see changes on x-ray. Now we know this patient does have psoriatic arthritis and not just psoriatic arthritis, but the, the more uncommon form that does damage bone. Now that patient sh certainly should be on a biologic because we know that those medicines are better than the alternatives that are out there in terms of helping to prevent progression of that bony disease over time. Biologics are not perfect at this. There will be patients who will still progress despite biologics, but you're stacking the deck in your favor. You're making it less likely that you will get worse and worse and worse in terms of bone damage if you're on a biologic or a powerful medication, if you have known bone damage to begin with.
And can targeted physical therapy alleviate arthritis? Certainly can alleviate the symptoms. And I'm a big fan of physical therapy. Um, but again, you're not gonna do physical therapy instead of medication. You're gonna do physical therapy in addition to medication. And particularly if you've um, gone a little bit further down the road before you got to your, your doctor, before you got started on effective treatment, if you got to the point where you kind of, um, your, your body kind of got for lack of a better word, lazy, right? Um, kind of like we all did during COVID, right? No one got out and did anything. We all gained a couple of pounds. We all got a little weaker. Nobody went to the gym during COVID. Well, if if you had that sort of thing happening to you, not because you were afraid of COVID, but because your psoriatic arthritis kept you out of the gym, then maybe it does make sense to help some, you know, have somebody help you to rebuild. If you feel that your arthritis is severe enough that you're not safe climbing the stairs, or if you feel that you're having balance problems because of your arthritis. Those are great instances where physical therapy can help us out, re-strengthen you, assist with your balance, assist with your safety. Do injections or infusions have better outcomes than pills? Uh, I, there again, it depends on each individual patient. I've had patients for whom injections or infusions were much better than pills. And I have other patients for whom pills were fine. I have a few patients for whom the pills were better than injections and infusions. It's an individual thing for each individual patient that you have to sort of determine over time between yourself and your doctor. Once a biologic is started, is it advisable to stop using it if you achieve remission? I think we already kind of answered that question. We are using a biologic to put the disease into medicated remission. And stopping the biologic generally speaking, does not work. There are rare instances in which people have been very lucky and have been able to stop their biologic, but um, we're beginning to actually see some research published now in the medical literature where this was actually done scientifically. You know, people volunteered to have their biologic medication withdrawn. Um, and some of these tests were done in what's called a blinded manner. In other words, they kept taking injections and they voluntarily knew that there was a chance that they were no longer taking a real injection. So now they couldn't talk themselves into it because they didn't know if they were having their biologic withdrawn or not. You know, they were still taking a shot, but was it a real or was it a fake shot? And when they look at this type of uh, data, they found that um, the vast, vast, vast majority of patients did not remain in remission. Um, so we generally do not recommend that people reduce the use of their biologics. And that's kind of an, another, um, Another thing, you know, not, not just stopping completely, but patients will ask, can I take my biologic less often? You don't want to drive the car in a way the factory didn't design it. You don't want to take the medicine in a way that the pharmaceutical company didn't design it. When they say take it weekly or if they say take it every other week, they didn't pull that out of a hat. You know, there was years of research and millions, usually tens of millions of dollars that were poured into, is it 14 days or is it seven? They came up with those numbers for a reason and, and you really should kind of stick to them in the vast majority of cases. Exceptions to every rule has to be discussed with your doctor. Can biologics become less effective over time? They can. So uh, biologics can fail in two basic ways, primary failure, you took the medicine and it never helped you at all. It just wasn't what you were looking for. Or secondary failure. I, I literally got off the phone with a patient an hour before, less than an hour before starting this webinar tonight, who their medication worked wonderfully for quite a long while. And then just over time, not doing as well, not feeling as well, wishing they could take the medicine more often because those last couple of days before the injection weren't as good as those first couple of days after the injection, and they, they can wear out over time. We wish we understood why that happened. The theory is that you're probably developing antibodies against the drug. So one of the big warning signs that a medicine is, is fading over time is that sense that it no longer lasts for the full dosing interval that the re manufacturer recommends. Kind of the opposite of what we were just discussing. So now instead of you know, calling me up and saying, hey, Dr. Mandolin, can I take this medicine less often? This is the reverse. The patient's calling me up and saying, hey, Dr. Mandolin, can I take this medicine more often because it no longer lasts 14 days or it no longer lasts seven days? Um, that's not, you're not doomed. But that's a warning sign that, ooh, maybe this medicine is starting to 
lose its potency, lose its power in you, um, because we believe that you're developing anti-drug antibodies. These medicines are proteins, the injectable and infusible ones are, are proteins, and your body is really good at recognizing non-human protein, um, and so you can develop antibodies against the drug, and as fast as you inject it in, your body can chew it up more quickly than we planned, and that's your first evidence that maybe you're going to get what we call a secondary failure of your biologic. Now, because that happens to you with one biologic does not mean it will happen to you with every biologic. It might happen to you just once in your life. You switch biologics, you're fine forever. Or I've seen unlucky patients in whom it seems to happen with everything we give them. You know, that works for a while and then starts to fade. And I've seen everything in between. Um, so um, this is uh, this is sort of the same concept as, well, why do I need a flu shot every year? Because the flu is different every year. Well, the sort of payback for that, um, the, the good side of that, is that if you do develop an immunity against drug A, you're not immune to drug B. So being uh, having one drug fade over time doesn't mean that we can't switch to another one. You're only developing immunity to that one agent. Any new treatments on the horizon? The short answer is yes. Uh, the long answer is that for the last two and a half, three years, anything that got submitted to the FDA that didn't treat COVID got put on the back burner because we had a bigger problem on this planet, um, unfortunately. Um, and so th there's been a huge backlog and we are hoping that over time we will start to see more and more new treatments. Um, the uh, the big European meeting um, called ULAR just ended um, over in Europe. I didn't get a chance to go this year, um, but I'm hoping to, to see a lot of YouTube videos and hear from a lot of my colleagues and read a lot of medical journals about all the wonderful advancements that have been um, announced at ULAR um, this year. So what are some of our treatment options? Uh, so we start with pain relievers, um, non steroidal anti-inflammatories. You see some of the, the names here on the screen. Um, we can then advance um, to, uh, let's actually skip to the third one. Um, the the fast-acting anti-inflammatory corticosteroids like prednisone are often early in the disease course. And then once we sort of get the fire put out temporarily, we get things under control and kind of get you back on an even keel, we then determine um, based on, as we were discussing earlier, what domain of your arthritis is the predominant domain. Are you joints? Are you tendons? Are you fingernails? Um, we then choose from some of the other things that you see listed here. So traditional systemics, these are pills that are generally taken on a daily basis. Methotrexate is weekly. Um, and then for those for whom those medicines don't work well enough, we can then go into uh, either biologics or targeted oral treatments. And you see some of the names uh, on there as well. And then non-pharmacologic agents are some of those that we've discussed earlier. Physical therapy, for example, um, would count as a non-pharmacologic um, treatment. And here is just a, a quick summary of the major um, biologics and targeted oral treatments currently available for psoriatic arthritis. Each column here represents what we call a mechanism of action. So basically, um, I think of inflammation as being a chain. And as long as we break a link in the chain, the chain is broken. And I don't really care which link, link in the chain we break. We need to break the chain. Um, so each of these columns represents a different link in the chain. And there are more than just this. Um, but these are the links that we have. We have a tool. We have a hammer that we can hammer on the link with. Um, so for example, if, if we feel that your psoriatic arthritis is probably driven by TNF-alpha, then we would give you a TNF-alpha inhibitor. If we think that maybe you're driven by IL-17, we would give you an IL-17 inhibitor and so forth and so forth. Um, the other thing that, that this chart brings up is um, if we get into a situation where unfortunately the first thing that we give you, let's just you know start at the top left. Let's say we give you Etanercept, um, sold in the US as Enbro. And let's ex imagine that it doesn't work. I've got plenty of people for whom it does, but let's let's imagine that it doesn't work. Then I would be more likely to switch to a different column I would be more likely to go across the top, you know, Stellara, Cosentix, Orencio, Tesla, Tremphia, Zeljans, rather than going down the column, Humira, Remicade, Symphony, Symmetia, because we want to hammer on a different link. Okay, that one didn't work. Let's try a different one. And of course, what we all wish we had would be that magic diagnostic test that would tell us definitively 
This patient is an IL-17 patient. That patient has overactive T cells. This patient is an IL-23 patient. And we would know from day one, this is the category we need to start in and focus on. That test doesn't exist. We're working on it, um, but it doesn't exist currently. Um, and so that's the, that's the current logic basically is pick an area and because of insurance and government regulations, we usually start on your left-hand side with the TNF alpha inhibitors first. Um, not necessarily because they're better, but because that's the way the FDA labeling is and that's the way the insurance companies want it to be. Is that the right way? Is that the most scientific way? The FDA part to some degree, the insurance part, not at all. <laughs> um, but that's that's how it's done, just to sort of give you an idea of what happens behind the curtain. And then um, I think this is our last section, psoriatic arthritis and comorbidities. Is the severity of the arthritis proportionate to other medical comorbidities like vascular events and uveitis? The short answer to that is we're not sure. Uh, it sounds reasonable, um, but I have had patients who have had relatively mild cases who did get other medical comorbidities that we felt were also inflammatory in their nature. Um, so not every uveitis, uveitis, by the way, is inflammation of an eye. Um, not every eye inflammation patient that I've ever seen has had a rip roaring case of arthritis. I've had patients who came in with relatively mild arthritis and the thing that drove them to me was they wanted a biologic or they needed a biologic treatment for their uveitis. And by the way, oh yeah, I have some arthritis too, but it's not that bad. It's, this is what's messing with me. So it's not always the case that your arthritis has to be severe for it to go outside the bones, outside the joints. We call these extra articular manifestations of arthritis. Um, and then how about, how does psoriatic arthritis and the inflammation from it affect the blood vessels? Here we're kind of early in the going. I kind of have to cheat a little bit and step back and take you across the street <laughs> into the realm of rheumatoid arthritis, which is also an inflammatory form of arthritis. So it also is um, a, an inflammatory process. We know that patients who have rheumatoid arthritis are more likely to have blood vessel problems, vascular disease, heart attacks, strokes, those types of things. In fact, we think that rheumatoid arthritis is as dangerous as smoking if you don't treat it in terms of people having a vascular complication, like a heart attack or a stroke. We don't know that that's the case for psoriatic arthritis. There's every reason to believe that it probably is the case, but I can't say that it's as bad as smoking in terms of psoriatic arthritis, that those data are still being collected, that science is still being done. We do think that um, all inflammatory forms of arthritis are not just in the bones and joints. And in the case of psoriatic arthritis, it's not just in bone, joint, skin, ligament, tendon, but that inflammatory arthritis is a whole body inflammatory process. And this potentially explains why there are vascular events, why there is eye inflammation and so forth and so forth and so forth. Um, so uh, the we do know that the process of atherosclerosis, hardening of the arteries, um, does have an inflammatory component uh, when, it, when it first begins. And we believe this is why inflammatory forms of arthritis probably are somewhat hazardous in terms of um, blood vessels. So we don't have a specific way to counteract that right now, other than um, early work is beginning to suggest that having your arthritis under better control may potentially blunt some of those risks. Can't say that with certainty yet, but we're moving in that direction. And so what we're telling patients in general is, if you have an inflammatory form of arthritis, then you may be at increased cardiovascular risk. We, with rheumatoid, we were confident in that. With other inflammatory forms of arthritis, we strongly suspect it. And we're telling people, so what that means then, since you have a built-in risk factor, is then that you should treat yourself better. You should modify those risk factors that you can modify. You, you can't change your gender. You can't change your age, but you can stop smoking. Um, you can improve your cholesterol. You can keep your blood pressure under control, all those sorts of things. That's what we tell patients with any form of inflammatory arthritis is do all the things that you're supposed to do to protect your heart and be heart healthy. But because you have inflammatory arthritis, you got to be better about it than the person sitting next to you.
And I think that takes us to the end of the planned questions. And we're right about at the end of the hour, actually. Perfect timing. Um, I, I, I'll leave it up to the NPF. Do we do we uh, run a little long or, or are we uh, are we going to be cut off by the time? I think these were really excellent questions that got submitted in advance. And I would yeah. I would having done things like this before, I would generally anticipate that most of what the audience has submitted is probably um, very similar to what's already been in the presentation. Um, but certainly, if if, uh, if the moderator has any uh, any burning questions that look like they're very unique and novel that we didn't address, I'm I'm here if you guys have time. Perfect. Go ahead. Sorry, uh, I've got one question that I'd like to throw out to Dr. Mandelin based on what came in this evening. Yeah. What are the benefits of joint injections? Joint injections are becoming somewhat controversial. Um, so there are most joint injections are steroid injections. So in the same way that you might take prednisone by mouth to temporarily alleviate um, rapidly, but temporarily alleviate an arthritis flare or gain initial control before getting on to some of these medicines we just saw in these last few slides. Um, if you have one or two very fired up joints that are way worse than the rest, you might get a joint injection with cortisone steroid to um, to calm down that joint rapidly and temporarily as a way to sort of put the fire out while we're getting things put together with your whole body general um, medication therapy. There there is a little bit of controversy with that um, in that everything in the world has side effects. Steroid injections can have side effects. There's concern about you know if you are that 60, 70, 80 year old patient who might be destined for for example a knee replacement someday. There's discussion about how much steroid, how many steroid doses can you safely give to such a patient before you're going to make the surgeon's job more difficult when the day inevitably comes that you're going to need that knee replaced. And that's, we don't have hard and fast numbers on that yet, but um, those discussions are, are ongoing. Um, so the short answer to the question is that um, if you have one or two joints that are clearly the big, big problem that stand head and shoulders above the rest, then those joints might be candidates for um, temporary rapid relief with a local steroid injection from your rheumatologist or maybe your orthopedic surgeon. Okay, and one other question and then we'll uh, wrap it up. Uh, they asked about bone damage. Can you define that a little bit more versus like thinning of the bone? Oh, right, right, right. Okay. So when we talk about um, thin bones, brittle bones, osteopenia, osteoporosis, we're talking about the loss of calcium throughout generally the whole skeleton. Um, that's different from the bone damage that happens from inflammatory forms of arthritis, like psoriatic arthritis. There we're talking about very local damage in a very specific region, um, usually right at the joint, where, you know, the, generally speaking, the shaft of the bone will not be damaged. It'll be the end of the bone on one end where it hits the one joint or on the other end where it hits the other joint. We'll have small areas of little um, pits or we call them erosions um, that happen right at the end of the of the bone in the area where the joint is, where the cartilage is, where the tendon is um, that can interfere with the function of the joint at that location. So we're talking about specifically very usually small, um, very focused areas of specific bone damage rather than just the whole skeleton being depleted of calcium like in osteoporosis. Terrific. Thank you for taking time to answer the extra questions. I'll turn yeah. it back to Brett. And thank you to the audience, um, those who uh, log on ahead of time um, for providing such excellent questions for the discussion tonight. These were These were really excellent questions. Agreed. Great questions. So thank I've, you all. I've had for doctors ask these questions, you know, the okay. non-specialists. When I go to talk to a to a general internal medicine, I've, I've had doctors ask questions of these caliber. So good on you guys. So let's wrap some things up. So thank you so much. I mean, I, I I learned a ton. I'm always shocked and amazed when you know I think I know something about psoriasis, and all of a sudden it's my mind's blown. So I really appreciate your time. And these were a lot of interesting questions and I'm sure that they're impactful and meaningful for a lot of folks. So I really do appreciate you, Dr. Mandolin.
Um, if you guys enjoyed uh, today's webinar, you'd like to learn more about upcoming webinars or events, be sure to subscribe and receive notifications for future events. You can view the webinar along with past webinars in our watch and listen site, psoriasis.org forward slash watch and listen. We've got our podcast series sound bites to hear uh, the latest episodes such as emphysitis unique to psoriatic arthritis, it's kind of a mouthful, with rheumatologist Dr. Lee Eater from the Institute of Medical Science in Toronto. Uh, definitely check that out. If you have questions and are looking for tips to exercise safely or just want to connect with somebody, definitely visit our patient navigation center via phone or email as indicated on the screen. Thank you all for attending this evening for our webinar. Please take the evaluation survey too uh, via the link that you will be receiving after viewing. Uh, today's webinar to provide us feedback. We like feedback about the presentation and content. Um, tell us what you think. So thank you all. Uh, I wish you all a very, very pleasant evening and we will see you very, very soon. Bye everyone.